And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to coming to a straight coming to a straight from the le the <laughs> the man who will probably argue argue to the till the end of the day on on the on a bunch of on a bunch of issues of weebery <laughs> and the creator of Trails of Bren the one and only Eric M Vlad how are you doing today I'm doing tonight? good thanks <laughs> yeah thanks yeah, I'm doing good thanks Mildred thanks for having me uh, thank by the way you. yeah thank you for thank you for coming on um so I'd I'd like to I'd like to start out with the humble beginnings in a sense um walk me through your first introduction to okay. role-playing games and what was it that made it stick for me well so for me ironically um so i only really started doing tabletop refugees probably like five yeah about like five four uh no about five years ago Mm -hmm. um prior prior to that like when i was in high school i'm 32 right now like when i was in high school every single time that I wanted um, to get involved in it. It um, all my friends would always have it on a day that I was working, um, or if there's a day that I was available, they were working that kind of thing. So I never really got a chance to do it. Um, plus, um, the ex that I was with at that point was really adamant that I didn't get involved in it. But that was she was judgmental. That's another story. But mm -hmm. um, but fast forward, a friend of mine who that I've known since middle school, he introduced me to pathfinder um he got my uh he got my fiance and i involved as well as a friend of mine that we've known all for a while and like you know how it is when your first character that you make you like you get a little bit overzealous with it you try to make them um be like the whole entire story is about them kind of thing and you learn a little bit after that but while we were going into this i was actually i was falling in love with it because i've always wanted to be somewhat like somehow involved with making video games but i didn't have the patience for learning coding plus i didn't want to make something that probably wouldn't succeed like that fear of making putting so much work into something like that um but at that point i decided hey you know what i i like to write a lot and i think i'm getting the grasp on how rule you know concept of rules worked so i actually was working on a game called trials of mirtha um which was there was nine races it was d it was d20 and all the other dice as well and my friend um my friend his name is scott he actually uh, him and i actually worked was getting to work on it but over time um, we even tested it out and everything uh over time it was kind of uh, it was kind of hard to like gravitate all the rules put together and i didn't really have that much of a concept on like other systems and whatnot like he actually told me try monster of the week you know, try something uh, simple at first. And if you're not familiar with Monster of the Week, it is a Powered by the Apocalypse style game. Mm -hmm. With um, And this one uh, used, uh, mainly utilized the 2d6 system. You know, just mm -hmm. two six-sided dice. Oh, yeah. And and eventually I decided while I was um, while I was doing this one, I was, I was just like, why not I just make something a little bit... Because I know with the d20 system, just whether you're doing it alone or you're doing it with another person... It's going to take a while, especially if you're trying to like start from you know the bottom up, or if you're trying to take influence from another system. So I told him that I was going to start working on this one, um, also because he mentioned try working on a system that you know isn't utilizing the D20 and whatnot as much as possible because it's going to take you forever. So and I did, and I did take his word on that because I did want to make different kinds of moves. I did want to make different kinds of races, character developments that. Kind of kind of stuff so uh since then i've been you know i've just been um asking people around to play test trials of brand i'm on my 11th rewrite mm -hmm. right now of the core rule but trying to perfect it as much as possible and the funny thing is um you know every player they have is a is an experience and obviously they tell you something that helps a lot with the game and when we finished um a campaign arc um, with it, he said that he felt burnt out, and at that point, I was just like, "And this is just this is fast forwarding, I know, but um, 
he said that he felt burnt out. And I was just like, okay, I think one of the reasons why he probably felt burnt out was because when you're just rolling the same two six-sided dice over and over and over again, plus it's probably more treated as the lower the amount of dice used, um, the shorter the campaign is anticipated. Like, you could say the same thing about Call of Cthulhu or Delta Green, where it's most of the time you're rolling, um, you know, percentile die. So I figure I started adding D4s and D8s into the game as well. But primarily, um, my humble beginnings uh, for creating Trials of Bren was merely, I don't have enough patience to make a video game, but I like the writing, and I felt like, you know, I, at this point I was approaching 30, and something happens, for, for me personally, it happened this way, I don't know about anybody else, but once I got to 30, I was just like, you know, you might as well start making something. Because you don't know how, nobody knows how much longer they have. So I started, you know, creating this game and just kind of from there just got overzealous about it. <laughs> yeah. Now, with tra with Trails of with Trails of Bren, um, given given that you mentioned doing a whole lot of stuff with with uh, Mo with Monster of the Week, was that was that the game that broke was that the game that broke you into tabletop or were were you ex were you experimenting with uh, with other games? So it was actually Pathfinder is what um, got me in, okay. but my, uh, but Monster of the Week was the one that I've um, was the first one I've ever GM'd, and okay. the thing is I've yeah and I've not done too too many, uh, just man because it sometimes it's hard to find play uh, it is sometimes hard far, hard to find you know players at the right time because like I also um, I play Pathfinder right now, um, but I also was GMing um, Call of Cthulhu and Delta Green because I like to go for the horror aspect a lot even even with monster of the week like i was looking up all these monsters for my players to face against and i would never ever choose like vampires or werewolves or anything of that sort because you kind of already know what you're getting yourself into i wanted to make sure my players actually looked into what they're up against but also add attention to oh this is what we're gonna have to expect to face kind of deal so i took influence from um, monster of the week mostly but i did take some concepts of mechanics like especially when you're on the battle grid um from like pathfinder starfinder um and all those games mm -hmm. and i can i can definitely see that with the t with the tier setup that you ha that you have um and now you now um trails of bren is de is described is described as a post war and, and what i'm the kind of thing that I'm seeing when I when I look at some of the art and some of the descriptions is, um, almost almost a almost a post Weird War Two kind of kind of thing with a little bit of diesel punk. Is that the is that the vibe you were going for? Kind of, sorta. Of. So basically, uh, what I was coming up with was, um, imagine I guess kind of a world in between Fallout and Bioshock in a way. Like I wasn't intending on doing that, but that's what people noticed. Um, and I was playing a lot of both games at that time, so I think that had something to do with it. Um, I like the Fallout vibe where, like, imagining... Because um, the world of Bren takes place 40 years after a great war um, with advanced AIs. Because I've always had wondered about the concept, you know, from watching, like, the Matrix movies. Um, and the, especially the Animatrix. Like, I remember watching that at a young age, and I was like, there's scenes in here that, like, scare the crap out of me. <laughs> but it was just the whole entire concept that what if at one point AIs... Have the capacity to go against us and in this world all the world powers like imagine if like america russia china like you know it just pretty much all those countries got wiped off the map because they had the closest contact to the most advanced form of technology you know and um at that point um in the story a quarter of the world population gets pretty much decimated because of it but then something occurs and it's kind of left up to theory in the story um whether it's like was there a patch that came through was the, the mechanicals notice something that they sh shouldn't wipe out everybody was there a and a player of mine actually came up with this concept and i thought it was brilliant where did a solar flare from the sun you know hit the planet and they all of a sudden realized we're screwed if we you know have if you know we have to rely on ourselves so they kind of like stopped fighting and they started and they caused kind of a ceasefire but it was an agreement where like we don't go to your land, you don't go to ours. So like all the world, the leading world powers have, their countries have been pretty much taken over, but all the other countries have pretty much been 
stuck in this position where like, okay, so who's pretty much going to be the leading power? How do we do exports, imports, that kind of stuff? Not to mention between the nine races that are in the game, um, certain ones just either they don't get along with each other because they're in the game there is kind of there is kind of um racial tension between some of them now i'm not condoning racism or prejudice by any means it's more for the lore uh setting in fact when you pick um some uh, when you which i'm calling them lineages just because i know the word race is very um it, it's a it's a very odd word now in the world of tabletop like i know with pathfinder they started calling them ancestors or ancestry I don't know what yeah. they call them in. I don't know what they call them in Dungeons and Dragons, but I'm they're assuming still, it's around the same. They're still they're still calling it race, but they're do, but they're doing something, but but they're doing something that in um in in a few in either a current or future book that I find that I I find I find to be a mistake, and that is tr trying to they they try they tried they tried to make this whole song and dance about how, about how they're getting rid of the negative modifiers for certain races. Like and the I'm, orc, yeah, no, like the orc uh, being less intelligent or whatever. Um, and I'm I'm sitting here going, "Good job, congratulations." The last edition did this back in 2008. You don't get a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> um, Simpsons did it. Yeah, it not only not only that, but um, but they're trying they're trying to fix they're trying to fix a problem that was already that was already fixed in, in 2008, yeah. as well as as well as something that 13th age, which is. Basically, fourth edition and third edition successor, um, di um, fixed as well. The idea the idea is you get one you get one ability modifier from your from your race, one from your class. You can't double dip. There's right. no there's no plus two and minus and minus two or any, or anything like that. And the right. reason and... the reason why back in the day the minus two was was had had been got, had been rid of, accord, according to the, according to the developers at the time. Right. Was they were having a harder and harder time justifying the plus two minus two setup, so you have ridiculous things like um, Warforged getting minus two charisma. Yeah, <laughs> I, to be honest, to be honest, with you, like I, I kind of feel like because um, uh, if you look at some of the races that I have or lineages in the game, um, like whenever you are picking, because you pick your lineage and then you pick your class, and when you start off with the lineage. Um, each one um, gets an advantage and a hindrance, but you get to pick which one. So, like, for example, um, there's a race of um, people called the Valerians. They're the fox people. And on their end, the, some of the positives are that, for instance, that they can see at night or they're because of where they're from, you know, as condensed as they were in, the, in terms of their culture, um, they're more likely to know another language more than you know the other uh everybody else because their people were very nomadic they were traders um and i'm saying traders like you know they you know if you they traded things they weren't traitors but like um because of that they had the capability to you know speak an extra language uh, more than the other ones but so uh, one of their negatives are you know unless they're taking a shower or something like that their skin is not very um they don't like uh, they don't like the feeling of like cold water for instance so let's say you pick an advantage they're like okay um, your character is nocturnal but um one of the negatives is when you're in a water terrain you know you have a negative one to certain roles because you know your character doesn't like it or there's the crustacean race of people called the obelisks or obelisks you know a friend of mine and i still get into debates on that one um where the, some of the positive things are that when they're in water terrains, you know, they move perfectly. They can breathe underwater. But one of the negatives is that when they're trying to charm or persuade someone, because they have a different, um, they don't, uh, they don't really have a throat like uh, all the other races do. So they have to, they talk in a certain way that's like by syllables. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why that gives a negative just because it's more out of these. Um, it's kind of like all of a sudden now you're dealing with a Colin Robinson from, um, what we do in the shadows, where they're having a conversation with you, but you're feeling drained by it. And I mean, that's probably a bad example, but basically it just boils down to, um, on that end, I do I did put certain th um, aspects in this game where, depending what lineage you picked, will determine like what advantages and what disadvantages you can get. And you do have to start off with both. But when you level up, you can get more advantages, or you can get rid of the hindrance, for instance. 
And when we mentioned the tier system earlier, um, when you level up, you can choose certain level up abilities. So like if, if let's say you're a level six, then you can pick um, you can pick tier one and tier two level up abilities. But if you're a level four, you can only pick tier one. So basically it's uh yeah, on on that on that end, um, I'm that's probably I'm probably gonna sideline at that point. But basically, as you level up, you can choose how you want to level up your character. I know it's kind of the same when you look at other games where they say you get this move, you get this, you get such and such. Mm-hmm. You can be a character that when you start off, you pick two moves from your class's table, and then if you wanted to, just not choose another move for the rest of the game, even when you get to level twenty, because that's up to you. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, on that end. Yeah. Now, with with that in with that in mind, something something I'm a bit cu- I'm a bit curious about Go ahead. is um first o- is first off when it comes to given the given the fact that you mentioned taking notes from Pathfinder and taking some notes from other, from other approaches, um, it's always important to go to go into the to where to the mechanic that is the all roads lead to Rome. Since that that's right. basically been the, I'd say I'd say for the most part been the standard that you look at a lot of RPGs and there's always one particular die setup that every die roll is go is go that the majority of die rolls are going to be rooted in. Um, mm-hmm. So what so, what particular setup is the core mechanic for your Rome? Right. So on um, this one, um, this is where I was talking like earlier. Um, at the end of the last campaign that I had um, for Trials of Bren, um, my my friend, who is also my GM in Pathfinder, he said he was burnt out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know some people would probably take that the wrong way, but in my end, I was just like, how can I make this better? Because he was also in my group for Monster of the Week, and both systems did utilize the 2d6 mechanic. And it is overly... The thing about 2d6 is it is overly simplified. But because it's overly simplified, the rules can also, you know, mistakenly barrel down into being overly complex, especially when I'm taking into consideration, like, okay, here's how the rules work if you're aiming at somebody underwater, or if they're flying, or if you're falling, that kind of deal. Because when I was playing Monster of the Week, it was very, there was, it's it's a great system, especially if you're like your first GMing and whatnot. Um, but one thing I was realizing as I was playing it was um, my players and I kept having to make um, some new homebrew uh, homebrew rules. Like my fiance, for instance, she was the expert, um, and one of the uh, one of the moves is that if you roll bad, then <clears throat> when you're looking into a dark past or whatever uh, relating to a creature that you're hunting, you find out that your character is a reason that they happened. Three games in a row, she got a six or less, and I'm just like. Which is, you know, the bad number. And I'm just like, okay, I can't keep with this story saying, you know, Mothman is the reason that, you know, bad things have happened. Or Graboids are the uh, the reason that bad things are happening, you know, because of you. So I just, you know, you have to kind of change a couple things. So as far as the die mechanic goes with Trials of Bren, it, it, it was mainly 2d6. And even when I was, um, you know, playtesting it for the last three, four years, I did kind of feel like, not necessarily that it was limiting... Um, but it definitely, some in some cases, it did, get, it did get repetitive by nature. But what I did recently, and this was actually very recent, and I've been testing it on my own, and it's worked a lot better because I think the sense of random, uh, like more options for randomization, like even in video games, I think when there's randomization, it keeps the game replayable. And I'm not just talking like roguelites. I'm talking like you see people who play Resident Evil games and they have a randomization option where that item you're looking for is not, you know, where you initially would know it'd be. Mm. It makes it more interesting when you have to do a little bit more hunting, basically. So I decided to add a D4 and a D8, not only to add, you know, some tension to certain uh, situations, but also so players can feel like, okay, this is random. So this is going to be fun Mm. uh, for the most part. So uh, currently I am trying to look for more play testers uh, to utilize this mm-hmm. um, and see how they feel about it. Like I'm even having um, at some point um, I want to, you know, get back into doing the campaign, uh, the campaign route, or even just a few one shots just to see how players do it. And I do have several players lined up um, to give it a shot. So I'm looking forward to that. 
Um, and I think some people were a little stranged out by the fact that there's... Okay, so you have 2d6, a d8, and a d4. I I guess, in a way, I correct me if I'm wrong, I feel accomplished that I don't know if there's another system that utilizes it like that, but it is kind of... Everything comes from an influence, and I will admit, like, you know, I did take I did take some influence from Monster of the Week, Pathfinder, Starfinder. Heck, even whenever I'm playing video games, like I come up with, um, you know, these all these concepts are just like, okay, this weapon in this game does that. I think I'm gonna put that into the game. Mm-hmm. Like I came up with a glove, for instance, in the game called the Percussion Glove, where if you are wearing this, as long as the target is 400 pounds or less. You can lift them, and they'll take falling damage. So, mm-hmm. and when it comes now, when it comes to the when it comes to classes, I'm I'm curious about the about the class design that you're sh- that you're um that you're shooting for. I um not too long ago I was ta- I did I was talking about class design when it came to four when it came to four E and us and us ranking classes. And the lo- mm-hmm. the lower ranked ones were the ones that, um, did that either didn't provide a whole lot of options, or in order to be effective, you had to do a certain strategy. And when it comes to, and when it comes to classes, um, there are the, there are those that are that try and go with a very restrained approach, and then there are those that try and do a more archetype approach of these are things you're better at. What right. approach do you have to class design? So as far as class design goes, um, it would be what is the campaign about? What is the session about? Mm-hmm. Realistically, too, I mean, most people when when they're starting to play a class, you know, they start off with what sounds cool, you know, for the most part. Um, so most of the I have twelve classes in the game, so like four of them are offensive, four of them are more support, four of them are kind of a mix of both. Um, like when I first was making this game, I only had. 10 classes now i have 12 Mm -hmm. um the last two that i decided to add was one was the bounty hunter because i did want to have someone who is invest like investigative but also offensive at the same time but then i also added the arsonist and just because i know that some players are going to see that and they're gonna they're gonna have fun with it Mm -hmm. and for the most part like i've had players um decide to with you know being an arsonist they set themselves on fire and they're fireproof, so they just walk towards enemies, and you know the reaction from the enemy is always "What the hell is walking towards me?" kind of thing. Or did that person just set himself on fire and they're coming towards me right now? Mm-hmm. So it adds for you know obviously some flavor, uh, some funny flavor text. But as far as um, each one goes, I know that there's certain ones. Surprisingly, not too many people pick the soldier. Um, like if we look at all the classes, we have the academic, the arsonist, the assassin, bounty well, hunter. Let's and, let's yeah. go with, let's go into them a little bit in a little bit in detail because, um, I'd like to, I'd like to I'd like to go through the twelve classes and kind of pick your brain as to what as to what what sort of fantasy that particular class is meant to fulfill and and where its particular net is within the within the sandbox. Okay. And, I'd like to start with the academic. Yeah, so the academic, um, essentially, I was trying to come up with like kind of a scholarly um, character, but without you know saying scholar in the game because in in this game I wasn't you know going for this game doesn't really have a uh, a magic system unless you're playing the missionary, but we'll get to that later. Mm-hmm. Um, so I decided to come up with what if it was someone who was like let's say very well for uh, like well first in uh, like they're a professor or they're a student or even something as far as they're a journalist uh, like they're an investigative journalist mm-hmm. so with the academic for instance if you start off as the academic your every class starts off with an ability that they get immediately like it's not one that they pick they just get it immediately mm-hmm. and the academics is that they're a know-it-all essentially so if you say okay i picked the academic okay what do they what do they know everything about and the person could be like, oh, they know everything about zoology, or they know everything about oceanography. And pretty much everything that they run into, they wouldn't have to roll for it as long as it pertains to it. Mm-hmm. Now, this, I am aware, can be overpowering. But as far as um, overpowering goes, that's essentially you know up to the GM and up to the player, obviously. Like, I played in games before where 
you know, like my fiance, for instance, was uh, her character was an oceanographer, but we were in a city, um, you know, next to the sun. So sometimes your character um, has to be put in an element that works against them. But as far as the academic goes, um, they are the know-it-all, but they're also the kind of person that if they wanted to do investigative you know, journalism, they have like a little bot on them, for instance, that they can just throw somewhere and it would pick up a conversation. They also, because they're essentially the, you know, quote, quote, smart one of the 12, they also have an ability called natural, which they can pretty much pick any ability um, from any of the other classes or lineages as well. Because somehow one way or another, with with some exceptions, um, one way or another, they know how to do this detail that another class already knows. Like I've had players playing the academic and they are just like, yeah, my character has a pet bull, you know, because the hunter has an animal companion um, move, for instance. Mm -hmm. And when I ask them, why does your character have a, a bull? And they're just like, ah, my character was, you know, they were like an, uh, they were like a botanist. So they lived on a farm. So they had a pet bull. So that's how the story went. Mm -hmm. So basically the academic is the know-it-all who might be able to have another ability. Like if they wanted to pick um, that they have an ability that the soldier has, you know, they could, because they could say that they studied guns, you know, growing up mm -hmm. or whatever. The arsonist admittedly was just for fun. Because I think every game, uh, no matter what, there's always going to be that one class because some people want to be the support. Some people want to be useful in every way, one, you know, way or form. Some people just want the one thing that sounds cool. Mm -hmm. And the arsonist is probably one of the most picked classes um, that I've had. Like everybody, the second that they see assassin, bounty hunter, missionary. Okay, that looks cool. Wait, I can set myself on fire. Wait, I can blow myself up and possibly live afterwards. Yeah, sign me up. So, uh, the assassin is, I'm not going to say self explanatory, but um, the assassin is pretty much um, most of the weapons that they would utilize are like silent weapons or melee weapons. They have the, capa uh, the capacity that if they're rolling for stealth, for instance, they would do double damage or they know how to get rid of a body really easy. So, essentially, the assassin's more um, for somebody who wants like a sniper on the team or they want a character who's more of a loner, even amongst the group. So the assassin fits there. Bounty hunter is kind of the best way I can put it, because I know we were talking about it earlier. It's kind of like um, Jet from Cowboy Bebop. Mm -hmm. Like the first thought that I had was, imagine if somebody who's like kind of on that gray area where you know they were a cop or an investigator at one point, but then something happened, and they decided to go on their own. But being a bounty hunter is you're on that gray line between like, are you doing this for good? Or are you doing this for bad? Because some of the moves that you have, for instance, are that you have contacts, shady contacts that would be able to help you. But you might have to do something in return for them. Um, but the benefit, but even if you roll bad, there is a benefit behind it. Uh, the engineer. Also, the bounty hunter is really good re with revolvers and handguns. Um, like there's one move called... Um, what did I call it? I think it was called Hammered Down. Yeah, it was called Hammered Down, mm -hmm. where basically you can take all the ammo in your handgun and just basically shoot every round. You can only use it once per session, mm -hmm. um, however. Certain moves you can only use like once per session. Uh, the Engineer, um, you can have a droid companion with the Engineer. You can also pretty much... This is one of those support classes that um, they can also throw a, tur uh, a turret. They can um they can also uh, install mods uh, for uh, for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, they can also make mods if they wanted to, but they'd probably be like temporary, uh, like temporary like one time mods or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so they're cra uh, they're very crafty individuals. You can also pretty much if you wanted to be like I want my character to have a car, the engineer would probably be the best bet <laughs> um, because they can they can start off with a vehicle because. You can buy vehicles, but you can also steal vehicles in this um, in this game. In fact, when we get to the thief, um, I'll just say this right now: the thief, for instance, they're able to. They have abilities where they can pretty much escape into the shadows. They now know how to lockpick really well. They have a skeleton key. They also know how to pretty much hotwire a car better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's the thief. Uh, the hunter, um, they can have an animal companion. 
they have the capacity. Oh, that's another thing. Engineers are also really good against robotic enemies, if you choose to have them be that way. Hmm. Hunters are really good against beast enemies. Um, they also have the capacity, along with having an animal companion, um, which you can choose to be like, I want an Ankylosaurus, I want a raptor, I want a... Um, you know, I want a dog, I want a cat, you know. There is kind of a limit but I'm, uh, to like what the size of the animal can be, but that's I also leave it to the GM's discretion because I know no matter what, no matter how much I how perfect I make this game as much as possible, mm-hmm. people are going to homebrew it. So, you know, that's strictly up to them. Um, but as the hunter, you can also influence an animal's actions if you choose to. Um, like if you want them to come to you, if you want them to aid you, that kind of uh, uh, relation. But your roles will impact what their mood or how long they're going to help for is. The Hustler was probably one of the hardest ones for me to put a title on. Um, primarily because I was trying to come up with someone who they could be tre- they could be a con, they could be a bounty hunter, like a real Han Solo mm-hmm. type of person. But I didn't want to attach bounty hunter to it. The hustler is pretty much, I guess, if I had to say an equivalent, like a bard, like the closest to the group having a bard. Bard um, or a um a face man, or just yeah, that, just that diplomancer kind of thing. Yeah, like they they use the they would prefer to use their words more than they would use a gun, for instance. Like if you notice with the hustler, most of their weapons are like they do low damage, but that's also because the hustler um during combats they could decide hey i'm gonna rally everyone and everyone has a plot you know has an advantage or they're gonna try and make the other side feel like shit with uh, with whatever words they have to say but another thing i should say also is each class uh, only has certain weapons that they can um start off with mm-hmm. but when you level up you can choose to get rid of that proficiency altogether so that's another thing too like do you want to continue playing the hustler who has all these guns or Eventually, at some point, does your character just like, you know what, I'm okay with using a machine gun, that kind of thing. Uh, but that's like later, but we'll, we'll get more into that. The medic is, um, the medic is obviously, they, they're they hugely useful. Um, they, in terms of like healing people, um, getting rid of diseases, making serums, but they also know certain details such as, there's one move that they have called acupuncture. And um, puncher spelled like the word punch. Um, and they're able to pretty much just go up to certain enemies, hit them in a certain way, and they're either not able to move or they drop their weapon. Um, essentially, they would know how to disarm someone. Uh, they also, they're also, their moves, uh, most of the weapons that they would have to are the ones that would like, likely cause someone to have to roll for bleeding. And bleeding is essentially if someone rolls against bleeding to see if they don't get it and they fail, then the next three um, rounds that person has to roll to see if they take a certain uh, if they take a certain amount of damage. Mm-hmm. So the medic the medic is kind of it's like a, it's an assassin wearing white, basically. Harm um, assist. <laughs> harm assist yeah actually I should change that to harm assist. I'm kidding. Um I should put that in though. Um but then uh missionary. Uh missionary was it took me the longest time to perfect this one, I think, because um, the missionary can be treated as someone who's religious um, or a monk. And basically, these are individuals that, along with trying to go out into the world and teaching people the ways of their deity or whatever, you can choose that this is either a good or a bad person, too. Mm-hmm. Um, they have capabilities that they can see the paranormal. Um, when they are fighting the paranormal, they do they do cause more damage. They can heal themselves. They can kind of do the equivalent of what the Hustler is for Rally, where they pretty much... Oh, another thing that they gave, and I learned this from a, um, from a game called... What was it? Desperados 3. Have you ever heard of that game? Yes, I, ha- I have, and, mu- and much, like, much, like a, much like the previous Desperados, um, they, I love the game, but the game does not love me back. <laughs> yeah. Same, no, it's, same with I, I, um, Shadow Tactics. I, I love those games. Like, I played those games for hours. I mean, some of the expectations were to, like, hey, try this thing where you beat the level in less than five minutes. I'm like, I could play this game for 20 years. That's not going to happen. Um, but one of the moves was uh, one of the characters had the capability that if they harmed themselves a little bit, they would be able to have another character basically do what they wanted. Mm-hmm. So, and I thought that that was kind of a brilliant concept that, like, 
you know, would you like if you had someone on your team that had the cap- capability of just go up and going up to someone close, you know, they would have to harm themselves. But now that person's pretty much under their control. Your first th- thought would be, I'm really glad that they're on our side kind of thing. <laughs> So the missionary um, does have that. They have a lot of more of the superstitious um, sense out of it, but they can also be treated as like a martial arts monk. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but I, I kind of like consolidated both of them put together. The only thing with the missionary though is they are belief bound, which means um, along with a immediate ability that they have, they also have kind of an immediate hindrance where, according to their religion or whatever their belief system is, they're not allowed to do two particular actions, and that could be like murdering for no reason sitting on the same side as the opposite sex um you know just things like that that i hear from actual religion like based on actual religions um you know that you hear that are actually in you know our world Mm -hmm. um so the missionary has those but when they get to a certain level they can remove one of those belief bounds another thing they have is they can also control water much like a waterbender i was debating going the route where they could do air or fire and earth, but I'm not sure if that would fit the tone. Um, but it's I'm on the 11 3, right, of the story. Who knows? I might change that. We'll see. Uh, the soldier, I don't think I really need to go too far into the soldier. The soldier's pretty much just the powerhouse. Like, they, in any sense of terms when it comes to combat, they do a lot of damage, um, and they know how to intimidate their foes. They know how to pretty much cover up a campsite so that no one can attack. Like, especially if someone wants to do a session where okay your group is traveling from here to here and there's a war zone do you want your characters to you know when they're trying to find a place to camp or whatever do you want to be able to you know cover it up or do you want to be able to uh pretty much an ambush and annihilate another group that's coming towards you that's what the soldier is the tank is um and this is the last, like, other than the thief, because I did mention the thief already. Um, but the tank is, you know, obviously the big one. Uh, you start off with a bunch of giant melee weapons. Um, you can start off with a shield. Um, they can pretty much take more damage than the other classes. They can make themselves... I forgot what game I got the influence of the idea from, but it was they, for a certain amount of rounds, if they wanted to, they could not take, like um the effects of you know as, uh, being acidified or paralyzed and stunned or bleed anything like that um oh mass effect i was thinking have a krogan sometimes they if you played mass effect where they go i am krogan and you know now next thing you know they're taking less damage i got that kind of idea from there mm-hmm. um so essentially yeah between the 12 races uh, 12 races the 12 classes um, you know, there's support, uh, there's offense, there's support, and then there's a bit of both. So I tried to divvy in, uh, divvy enough, uh, divvy them up between, um, uh, between the 12. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing that I noticed when I looked at the class entries is they're kind, they're kind of set, they're kind of set up almost like, almost like a powered by the apocalypse playbook, which leads me to wonder, um, what you end up getting for level for leveling up, especially since we're dealing with twenty levels worth of material. So, um, as far as that goes, and I'll, um, I did take some influence from the power by well, at least Monster of the Week, where if you fail a certain roll, um, but if you also finish a combat, as long as it's not one that you ran away from, like if you make if you finish the combat where you annihilate everyone on the other side, or the other side tries to run away then at that point you get the experience point mm-hmm. um so those are the two ways that i utilize leveling up and it kind of because i did i did like the idea that it balances between all right when you're making your character are you going to want to try and make them overpowering or do you want to be room where like okay you failed this role but guess what now you're leveling up quicker mm-hmm. and some of the level up abilities are you can you know, add a plus one to one of the uh, one of the stats that you have, and that's athletics, brain, fight, personality, and senses. Mm-hmm. And each one covers a different topic. Um, so, um, the more essentially, the more that you fail, the more in danger that your character is going to be, but the more likely they're going to uh, level up. Mm-hmm. So, and when it comes when it comes to when it comes, 
I think the I think the big qu the big question that I end up having is um is there is that is that even even within two characters who are picking this who are picking the same lineage and class um, as they level up are they going to be able to differentiate them, themselves because that's the key. oh yeah oh and yeah these kind of as... these kind of build setups yeah because when you love uh, when you level up um, you can even pick. Um, when you get to a certain tier, you can pick a ability from another class, or you can choose to get um, what's referred to as fate point, uh, fate points back. Because in this game, um, you have seven fate points. Once you lose all of them, and then you uh, lose, you know, all of your life again, then you have to roll to determine if your character is going to die. Mm -hmm. This, however, because I didn't like the concept that, um, and I tested it for the longest time, and I noticed that players were like spoiling themselves with this where if let's say it's a one shot for instance and they decide what they can do with their fate points is if they lose all their health then you know they go into it incapacitated status just to add tension mm -hmm. and then you know they get four health back but you know they're unstable at the same time too or they can choose to be like hey i rolled really bad at this can i use a fate point to make it a perfect result and you know that's perfectly uh, that's perfectly fine however um, depending on how long the session's going for, and this is a rule that I'm just starting to play test as well. Um, if let's say the session is less than two hours long, if you lose two fate points, um, you would have to roll to determine if your character dies or not. Mm -hmm. If it's a session that goes between, uh, if it goes longer than two hours, then it would be three fate points. Um, and I think that. Um, it adds tension and it does add the concept that your character is not ever completely safe. Like you're not going to be in a situation where, oh, it's okay. You know that I lost two fate points. I still have like five more. No, if you lose one more this time, this session, you could die. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I got that idea from playing Pathfinder, actually the new edition where, um, especially once you get into dying one, dying two, you know, etc. And I kind of liked that concept where it's just like, you know, it, if it's done enough times in one session, then I think that should be utilized. So, yeah. and based on based on that, I'm curious, and the and the fact that um, health caps out at eight, I'm guessing that the, I'm guessing that this is going to be a game where characters are going to be are going to be some degree of squ of squishy if they're not properly armored. Yes and no. So like um, armor is an option, but when you level up, you can um, you can also level up to get more health as well. So if you let's say once you get to tier two, one of the level up abilities is that you can have plus one to your health. And you know sometimes players will say like, okay, do I want to do this or do I want to have this move um, that I've been waiting for since you know I started? And and um, and. On the character sheet, I don't know if you've seen the character sheet just yet, mm -hmm. you can't, you know, there's enough space that when, if you choose a plus one health, you know, you can add it. Another thing is to, if you go for the class, um, the tank class, one of their abilities is that they can have a plus one to their health. Mm -hmm. So, and I think there's one, two, three, I think there's three times out, um, including if you're the tank. I think the max health that you can have is plus 11. 11 or 12. I would have to look into it again. Because um, I don't remember if the level up abilities, if there's a plus one health one, uh, for tier two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, yeah, your character can become squishy. Um, but you, uh, you know, your character can start off squishy. But one of the things with this game, and I took this from Resident Evil, actually, early Resident Evil games where it's all inventory management where, um, and I know the thing is, I know some players, uh, felt it was kind of a stressful concept at first, but as after like one session in the game, they were just like, Oh no, this, this makes sense. This is fine. And it actually makes it more fun that you realize I have a certain amount of equipment that I can carry on me, but if I'm equipping it, then, you know, that gives me more space. So if somebody wants to, let's say, get light armor or heavy armor, you know, mm -hmm. or if they just want to add more health, they can. Um, but that's not always going to be perfect. For instance, heavy armor. It protects you from a certain amount of damage more than light armor would. But are you proficient in it? That's a level up ability. Or even if you are proficient in it, um, if you're wearing that armor, you're going to get a negative if you're trying to, you know, go around stealthily. 
So it's really a game of inventory management and utilizing, do you want your character to also have this? Um, but it's not, when I first, I'll admit when I first started making this game, because, you know, when you're in the mindset of the GM, you're thinking like, okay, here's what I'm going to add to make sure the parents aren't, you know, the parents, the players aren't overpowered and, you know, that there's a sense of punishment. But then after a while, I think this is around the fir- the end of the first or the second year that I was making this game, I started realizing I should probably start looking at it more as the perspective of the player mm-hmm. where, you know, they get these cool abilities but they also feel accomplished whenever they finished a combat or they finished just doing anything pretty much. And I think that's um, because I've heard stories from other people who make their own games and you look at the rules and you realize there's a lot of punishment in the system. Hmm. And it's not to say that my system like trials of Bren doesn't have, you know, some of that, but it's more on the balance of, okay, you know how to keep your character alive and you know what abilities and inventory items to pick to get rid of like a burned, you know, effect or, you know, you have armor that protects against electrical damage. So therefore you're not going to get stunned. Or do you want to wear that heavy armor? Because the second you go into that water, you're just going to sink. Do you have, you know, do you have a, you know, a helmet that makes you breathe underwater? Are you a crustacean race, the obelisks, or are you a missionary where you have that water ability that you can make a bubble, put it around your head for a certain amount of time, and you can breathe underwater. So mm-hmm. your character is essentially as squishy as you allow them to be. But if you notice the first page, um, the first page that I have on the core rule book, I wrote, your fate is in the hands of proper planning and luck. So I, some of the concept that I got was from a video game called Death Road to Canada, where at any point, your group, and it's one of the fun, like, to me, it's a top 10 game for me personally. Um, like if I was stuck on a desert island and somebody told me this is the only game they can play for the rest of your life, I'd be like, okay. Because going back on that randomization thing, the game is so random, uh, so randomized, you could have a series of great characters to play with or shitty ones or a bit of both. Um, you could have all the inventory resources in, and whatnot. But there's always that sense of, you know, if I do this, if I do this right, you know, I'll get, I'll get through it. But if I make one stupid mistake, the whole group can die. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that I'm not, I'm not saying that in a way that the system, you know, the system is meant to punish the players. It's meant to make the players feel like they've accomplished something um, after, you know, after dealing with, you know, a giant monster on a bridge or they're trying to, you know, get through a jungle filled with slugs that, you know, could eat a person and, two seconds kind of deal. Mm-hmm. Now, the other, <clears throat> when it comes to, when it comes to, we- when it comes to weapons, um, mm-hmm. because of, because of the, t- because of the tech level um, being inspired by things like, fa- like Fallout and Bioshock, there's a couple questions I have on it. One, um, would it be fair to say that, that um, ranged weaponry is favored? Term- I would go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, it, more in ter- more in terms of what more in terms of what it can do and just and just overall threat. Yes and no because there is um, inventory management as far as how much ammo you are holding on to, mm-hmm. and I know that especially after playing Starfinder, for instance, I know people that were very iffy on the whole entire how much ammo do you have. Um, but I did, uh, I did try setting up the system to where you are able to keep track of how much ammo you have. Cause it's, the system is not just entirely combat based. So like there's other things along with it, but, um, as far as what's the most preferred, there's three types of weapons in this game. There's melee, there's the ranged and there's the throwables <clears throat> with ranged. They have the best capacity of, you know, obviously hitting targets that are further away. And also, I recently just added a rule that if, let's say, the t- uh, you know a ranged weapon's range was thirty feet, you can technically hit a target that's another thirty feet, you know, after that away, but it'd be for you know significantly less damage. Hmm. Um, just it's, you know the sort of concept that the weapon's more effective up close. I'm not a physics major. I don't know if that's true. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't because I assume that the farther it goes, but it's also 
it's also in a world where you know they regressed their technologies so the weapons themselves are included as well so if like a player has a regular pistol then you know it might not be as effective at least as let's say whatever the equivalent of like um, a gun that causes nothing but acid damage um, would do because it's like let's say you find a weapon that's like 40 or 50 years old and it hasn't been opened up in a while and people are afraid to open it because it's technically a robotic weapon or it was a weapon used during that time so that's a yes and no kind of thing because there is such thing as if you roll bad your gun can jam and you might have to spend like a certain amount of movement speed to unjam it basically um but weapons can become low quality but low quality typically happens if it's something that happens a lot like your gun jams constantly or you're using a melee weapon against someone who has you know heavy armor and the weapon that you're using does like one damage usually so um as far as but then there's also throwables such as you know shurikens grenades um and i even put tears into weapons where um, some weapons do zero damage because they are more of a support role, like a smoke grenade, or let's say a you know a dart from a you know a dart rifle that when you shoot someone it heals them or it potentially starts putting them to sleep. So it's a lot of uh, situ for between the melee throwables and ranged. I think it's a lot more of not what's the most preferred, but uh, essentially what's your character most comfortable with because you can have advantages with melee weapons like if you're an assassin but then you have a weapon that says if you're doing a sneak attack it does additional damage i even took influence from assassin creed and put arm you know dagger mm. into the game as well or let's say you know you're the arsonist you like throwing molotovs all over the place so that could fit more with the character i don't really think people have a preference um, between the three, I think it's just more treated as what's more convenient at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, you, with that, with that in with that in mind, um, given given the given the given the random nature of things and and the and the fact that asi putting aside putting aside the rare exceptions, most characters are probably going to have relatively low hit points. Um, when it comes to mitigating damage, are people going to have multiple chances to do that? Mm -hmm. Wait, I'm sorry. Oh, that. Um, oh, that was. Uh, sorry, that was the end. Uh, that was the end of the question. Just yeah. If people, oh, okay. Um, as far as yeah, as far as um, between, and this is it, admittedly, this is still something I'm working on, as well. Um, mm -hmm. because when it comes to let's say okay. Um, your party is going up against, you know, a bunch of enemies on the other end. I've had players, you know, go against enemies that do a lot of damage and pretty much defeat them in no time. But then they go up against, you know, creatures that do low damage, but because they have effects such as, you know, sleep or acidify, which pretty much lowers their armor's influence for the combat, or they're stunned all the time, or they're in water and they're the equivalent of an electric eel. So it's uh this is uh, this is one way that when I first started making the game I was focusing too much on okay how much damage can I do how much damage can they do and I think especially if you're going for like I think it was Alfred Hitchcock, Hitchcock that said it, it was that suspense is more import, is more effective than shock like do you want your uh if you're the, in the perspective of the GM or even the player do you want to put the other character in a perspective that, okay, you're stunned right now. You've fallen to the ground. What can you do right now? What do you have on you to get out of this situation? I think I've even had for um, my last group's campaign, the ending of the campaign arc, they fought a giant monster that could regenerate itself and spew ice shards from its back towards them. And they annihilated it. In no time, and that was, and that was the, you know, the final boss for uh, for the campaign. So, I think, on that end, it really tailors down to what kind of player do you want to play? Because like assassins, um, do you want your character to before they get themselves stuck into a combat? Do you want the assassin to take another route, 
and see if they can assassinate as many people as possible or cause the most damage beforehand. Mm -hmm. Or do you want to throw a turret in there, you know, on one side and then the party ambushes on the other? Because there is going to be moments in this game where, like, there is enemies that are overpowered. But at the same time, depending what your move set and all that is, you can prevent the other side from causing more damage. Because, like, one, for instance, one of the roles, um, well, one of the stats is fight. Fight determines um, what you you are in the initiative order, as well as how much damage. Well, what is the chances that you're going to, you know, be able to damage the other side? But there is also um, a rule that if you get 10 plus with fight, for instance, um, you would roll a 1d4 to determine what buff you get. And that could be plus one damage. The other side gets a negative one. You get a plus one that you can add to your next roll or a teammate's, um, that kind of deal. Because I, I don't really think with damage output, I've seen groups that do low amounts of damage annihilate groups that do a lot just because they were well prepared or they had the right moves to do so. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the now with the now with that in mind, were the obviously whenever de, whenever you're developing something, there's going to be a lot of the stuff that's on there is a drop in the bucket compared to the stuff that got that got left on the cutting room floor. Um, right. Were there any were there any ideas that you try that you tried to implement early on, but as you did more testing, it was clear it just wasn't working. I think there were certain rules that I realized that there was too, like, I was focusing too much. And this is like the GM being powerful mentality where, like, there's too many rules that I was coming up with. I was just like, oh, if this happens, then you have to do this. And then, you know, the player has to roll for this, but then they have to do this and they lose this much movement speed. And it was just like, it became too much. Like, there was, um, for instance, with. You know, fight roles again. Uh, when I first started, it was that if you wanted to make the other side have to roll to determine if they're going to take bleeding or you know acidified or frozen status, you know they had to get like a perfect twelve. But then I realized that that as I play tested it by myself, I was just like, this is agitating. So I and I lowered that down, and then I started implementing. You know, when you get to that. It used to be you would roll a 2d6, um, you'd have to get a 7 plus, you know, like natural to make sure that you didn't get an effect. Mm -hmm. I decided to change it around now to, you know, 1d8, where it's pretty much a half, um, a half chance at that point. And I, f and, you know, that adds more to, you know, I guess the tension of instead of, because I've noticed that there was certain rules that I put in that. It favored the GM more, so I subsidized that. And then there was some that it you could tell that the players were pretty much overpowered to the point where they weren't having fun. So I would make so that's why I started implementing things like the one D four randomization, the one D eight to determine if you take a certain effect. I've even changed like things such as falling damage, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and even the fate point system, as I mentioned, because I yeah. felt like. I felt like if you um, if you feel confident that you have seven fate points left and you just used three in this combat right now, that's okay because then, you know what, you're going to level up, you can get a fate point back. Or, hey, I have four more that I can just abuse, basically. So at that point, I decided, you know, I felt like, you know, in certain, se uh, certain sessions, I could tell that the players were abusing that, um, not in a good way. Or they're looking at, you know, the character, they're not feeling like the character's in danger. So that's why, at first, if your character ran out of health, instead of just getting four health back and you're just back into the fight, your character's now incapacitated. You have to roll to see if they, you know, get out of being incapacitated. Or maybe another player has something like a booster or an adrenaline shot that would wake them up. Um, mm -hmm. So I implemented that just to add tension. And then recently... Uh, you know, after I played Pathfinder a few times, and because in Pathfinder, uh, my fiance's character, um, who was a cleric, was killed uh, because she was getting into the dying condition so many times um, in, an essential, in what was essentially like a really small dungeon crawl. And I decided, you know what, I think I should add that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's adding things that 
you know, it, it's not to punish at all. Mm-hmm. It's to make sure that, you know, I know that the player's not getting bored. It's to make sure that I know that I'm not feeling too overpowering. They're not feeling too overpowering. Um, and that's at least how it is with the mechanics. Um, mm-hmm. As far as, you know, even the moves with the play, uh, like the classes and the lineages and whatnot, I wanted to make sure that they would make they would make sense in the long run because there's two races that are good in water. That's the Beldonians, which is the Cobra people, and the Obelisks, which is the Crustacean people. Mm-hmm. But the Crustacean people get more of the good side as far as the water goes because in the lore, they originally came from the water. Mm-hmm. So, and I know there's probably like 30 more that I can think of right now, but I just can't think of it. Like even. On my end, I have whenever I'm working on the rewrites, I have a separate pay, uh, page of just everything to update. Um, and I even ask my players. I'll ask them, "Hey, from a player standpoint, does this make sense? Would you feel happy if you know the GM came up to you and said, okay, we changed this rules now this?'" And I would always make sure that it's not just something that I decide on my own. Like I'll ask other, I'll ask other players that have played this game before, like, "What do you think?" And they'll you know, they'll tell me if they think it's necessary or if they do, they think it's not. So. Mm-hmm. Well, with that, with that in mind, I know I know that this is something that's in, that's in active develop. I know that this is some that's in active development. But um, mm-hmm. what what are you what are your plans with um, Trials of Bren in the com- in the coming weeks and months? So, as far as the coming weeks and months go, I do want to get a more <laughs> grounded version of the core rulebook. Mm-hmm. Um, finalized. Um, I do want to get more. I do want to get more players in terms of, you know, just just want to make sure that I'm making a game that people are having fun. They're not feeling burnt out even after the twentieth session. Um, and I know that's probably a lot to ask because I know everybody has their lives and whatnot. But my my ne- one of my next goals is to, you know, get at least another group in um, the play test for not just play testing purposes but for fun. Um, another thing is to. I do re- uh, realize, especially because on Twitter, for instance, I see a lot of um, like very, very good developers, very good artists and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I see that there's some people that have like 300, um, you know, only 300 likes to their page. And, you know, they're already getting well known because they have something set on Kickstarter. Um, I'm not going to say that I'm at the Kickstarter stage yet, but I am. Th- I am actually in heavy debates right now. If let's say through, I don't know, something like drive through RPG or something of that sense, if I wanted to put out like a teaser, um, like a teaser kind of version trials of Brent. So it is probable in the next coming months, I might decide to actually finally um, release my work out there. But I also want to make sure that it's as perfect as possible before I do so. And I'm not just talking like mechanics. I'm talking like even the way the rules are written because mm-hmm. I have, like for me, for instance, I do have a learning disability. So whenever I'm writing these rules out, you know, I'll write it on one sense, but then sometimes I'm reading the rules in a certain game or even, you know, for my job, for instance, and they write the description, but it's so many words, you know, it's it's so quick that if you just read it, that you might not understand it. So even in the core rule book, I'll put, for example, such and such and such. So my plan is... I do want to get better at the artwork um, that I'm making for the game as well. I want to perfect the rule book. And at some point, um, including getting players again, I would like to maybe put some sort of teaser out uh, for Trials of Brent, just so people can start being aware um, of how the game runs and all that. Mm-hmm. I can, I can, I can get that. Well, with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my show and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah, no, thank you for thank you for reaching out to me. I very much appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, 
My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.